Good afternoon. My name is Naman Manzoor, and today I'm going to be discussing advanced applications of endoscopic ear surgery. I'm thankful to Dr. Tofik and Dr. Haynes and the rest of the Vanderbilt crew for the invitation to present. I have no pertinent disclosures. The objectives of this presentation is to understand various applications of endoscopic ear surgery and routine or logic um, surgery, such as surgery for superior canal dehiscence, as well as some of the advanced applications, especially for Petrus apex lesions, as well as um, other neurotologic problems. Uh, I like to think of endoscopic ear surgery as a tool, and um, it, it can be used in certain situations or scenarios where it can potentially help or uh, solve the problem um, because of various advantages which it does bring. So <clears throat> we all know that um, you know, endoscopic ear surgery has evolved because of, um, in tandem because of uh, evolution uh, and improvement in technology. So you know, this is a diagram which is from one of the clinic articles and it shows clearly that the optics and the visualization has improved over time and hence, uh, uh, there is a push or there's a drive for doing more and more of these surgeries using the endoscopes or using hybrid approaches uh, where endoscopic portion can be uh, used uh, in certain uh, critical portions of the cases. So um, the first example I want to bring is superior canal dehiscence. Uh, now, without doing a deep dive into the overall management, we all know and understand this disorder. Um, it was traditionally approached through a middle fossa approach. Um, however, there are some situations where the anatomy is challenging and complex and um, some institutions and some surgeons use endoscopes um, through the middle fossa corridor to improve the visualization, especially if there's a anatomy around the arcuate which is unfavorable or if there's a larger dehiscence or if the dehiscence is involving superior petrosal sinus. Um, about 12, 13 years ago, uh, there was a push towards uh, reporting outcomes through the transmastoid route. Um, and this is the paper written by Dr. McGarian, which came out in 2009, um, looking at three patients where such an approach was used. Um, and these patients were primarily treated in an outpatient setting. And uh, since then, there's been a a significant amount of publications describing this. More recently, um, people have used a hybrid approach. Uh, this is a video report in our uh, otology and neurotology journal <clears throat> from the Hopkins group. In the next couple of cases, I'm going to show you um, the way uh, these underwater endoscopic repairs of uh, dehiscence superior canals are done. I use a combination of uh, the approach described in these uh, different articles. So and this is a first case where um, there is a dehiscence right at the level of the dome of the sphere canal. This is on the right side uh, up on partial views. Uh, this can be visualized as well as Stenvers clearly showing that there is a dehiscence. This patient pre primarily presented with um, bothersome somato sounds. Um, and uh, so further testing, um, did show um, on the right side, she had a mild uh, mixed low frequency hearing loss uh, down sloping to mild to moderate levels in the higher frequencies in her ear function is preserved. Her cervical uh, vestibular evoked myogenic potentials uh, showed a reduced thresholds. Even at 65 decibel, there was a response on the right side and thus confirming the SSCD syndrome diagnosis. So the initial approach for this is uh, through a standard postricular mastoidectomy approach. The mastoidectomy can be tailored and doesn't have to be an extensive mastoidectomy. And once the antrum is open, the lateral canal is visualized um, and the tegment is thinned enough. And then I usually block the attic with, a, uh, with bone wax. And then um, from that point onward, the operation is converted to an endoscopic portion which is done um, throughout under a, a balanced salt solution medium um, using different systems uh, and irrigating 
uh, um, bath can be um, employed um, so that uh, once you are opening up the endosteum of the superior canal, uh, there is no um, um, air um, going into the exposed labyrinth. Um, and as such, you know, different people think about it differently, but um, at least it minimizes the chances of any pneumo labyrinth and also affords um, a very direct and uh, better visualized repair. So this is the portion where we are under continuous uh, irrigation and um, using a diamond drill at low um, setting, uh, the superior canal is, is blue lined um, uh, till the level uh, of the endosteum. And uh, both the ampulated as well as non-ampulated end are, are blue lined. Uh, some people like to do this under um, image guidance, but um, usually the landmarks are sufficient to help us um, reach the proposed site. And then um, once the endosteum is opened, um, first around the ampulated end, um, uh, then uh, the sequential steps for plugging are performed um, using first dry um, um, fascia graft. Um, this area is plugged and then followed by uh, bone chips. This area is further reinforced. Similar steps are done on the non-ampulated side. Uh, care is taken not to drill closer to the common crews because uh, that of course won't be good in terms of plugging of the posterior canal. So um, similar steps are done. Bone chips are also used um, to ensure a more robust high impedance repair on both sides. After this portion of the surgery, um, uh, I usually uh, resurface this entire area with bone wax, uh, bone uh, pate, a fascia graft, and, uh, and as well as bone cement hydroset to kind of reinforce the metal fossa. Um, so this is the post-operative results from this first case, which shows uh, there is no hearing loss, no new high frequency hearing loss. Um, and uh, the post-operative CVAMP uh, shows um, a normal threshold response now, and there is no um, sub-threshold response in that year. The second case <clears throat> shows a larger uh, dehiscence involving the ascending limb a dome. Um, so it's a larger dehiscence, both, both visualized on partial and uh, Stenworth's view. And um, this case had um, the uh, concomitant audiological uh, aberrations of superior canal dehiscence, including a pseudoconductive hearing loss in the low frequencies, as well as uh, low threshold uh, CVAMP on that side. And uh, this operation uh, steps are similar. This is where um, after drilling a very targeted mastoidectomy, the attic is blocked. Um, and then um, under a continuous irrigation setup uh, with balanced salt solution, the, the ampulated and non-ampulated end of the superior canal are visualized. And then <clears throat> the subsequent steps of the repair are done under direct uh, visualization uh, in a continuous uh, um, balanced salt solution medium. So the ampulated end has been plugged here, then the non-ampulated end has been plugged and reinforced. Um, this was a larger dehiscence. And as you will see in some of these cases, once you make this approach, you can see actually the entirety of the metal fossa dura through the dehiscence. And in this case, I elected to repair and reinforce even that through the dehiscence. So we used a piece of uh, cartilage graft as well as associated perichondrium um, to really um, reinforce that area um, to provide more uh, robust repair at that site. And after this, like in the previous example, um, bone pate, bone wax, fascia, and bone cements are used uh, to kind of reinforce this entire area. This is uh, post-operative results for these, this particular patient. Um, have not caused any uh, worsening of hearing um, or high-frequency new hearing loss. Um, and um, the CVAMP on that left ear is now at 80 um, decibel um, threshold level. 
um, instead of 65, which it was before, there is a concomitant improvement subjectively in symptoms as well. So um, with this, um, um, I'm going to move to the next um, area where endoscopic approaches can be used. Um, and this is uh, probably in concert with what Dr. Marchioni will discuss uh, later on, which is transcanal uh, endoscopic approaches to the petrous apex uh, and beyond. And um, so in this particular case, uh, I'm going to focus just on the transcanal infracochlear corridor. So um, this is a corridor which uh, is a well-established route to address petrous apex pathology. Um, this corridor is bordered by the carotid artery, the jugular bulb, and the promontory. And um, uh, this is more of a route for drainage procedures. Um, so previously, people have reported on endoscopic approaches to petrous apex cholesterol granulomas, where this kind of a dissection leads um, and gives enough corridor to um, open up uh, the cholesterol granuloma and, and drain um, it um, successfully. Um, these are schematics from Dr. Marchioni's book. So this particular example, this young gentleman presented with um, significant headaches, um, ear fullness, um, symptoms, uh, imaging, both CT scans and MRI revealed uh, an expensile lesion in the right petrous apex and uh, imaging characteristics uh, with the T2-based um, uh, hyperintense signal, as well as uh, a T1 contrasted scan showing um, an expensile lesion with peripheral enhancement. Uh, there was no diffusion restriction, so preoperatively, <clears throat> this looked more like um, a mucosal with an inflammatory component to it. Uh, could have been um, another, uh, you know, neoplastic lesion. Um, because of his symptoms, um, uh, we discussed uh, treatment options, and because of his anatomy, we chose a transcanal endoscopic uh, infracochlear corridor approach. So in these cases, um, a large superiorly based tympanometal flap is designed, and uh, Using suction elevators, this is elevated from the ear canal. The annulus is elevated and all the eardrum is reflected superiorly. I did not deglove the malleus in this particular case. I think there was enough corridor and his uh, anatomy was very favorable. Um, so um, using a drill, uh, canal plastic can be performed to um, enlarge the access. And once the canal plasty is, uh, is done, um, you can see the internal carotid artery coursing anteriorly. Um, the cochlear promontory is here. This is the fustus. Um, and then this is the um, corridor leading to the petrous apex. And um, this, again, has limited um, uh, visualization, limited access because of instrumentation, passing of the instrument. So <clears throat> this is definitely a corridor which should be used um, for more of a drainage type procedure. In this particular case, once we were in the, in the cystic lesion, there was no uh, def definitive component which we would see in cholesterol granuloma. Um, this obviously um, looked more of, uh, of an infected or an inflamed mucosal with a very thick cyst wall. Um, it was, um, um, uh, and again, just to show that based on the preoperative uh, measurements, uh, this, this area was about two and a half centimeter deep to the annulus. So again, using some angled instrumentation, we, we debulked most of the anterior cyst wall and irrigated it. Um, and then eventually um, took some biopsies and cultures to ensure this was not a neoplasm or some other pathology. And it came back as an inflammatory tissue um, and cultures were negative. So. Uh, Again, this is an approach which um, could be used for selected petrous apex pathology. Um, again, in the end, we can we place a silastic sheet as a as a as a stent, and then the attic, um, sorry, the canal was reconstructed with a cartilage pericardium island graft, and the tympanometal flap was relayed back down. Um, so this is an, again an example where um, endoscopic exclusive transcanal approach can be used to address a petrous apex pathology. 
Um, and this is his post-op scan, which uh, does show uh, that mainly we were able to remove uh, the pathology um, and the inferior aspect of the lesion um, and there's some enhancing uh, tissue right around the petrous carotid, which was of course left behind. And uh, the mainly the inferior of 60% of the lesion was, or was removed by this uh, approach. So the last um, case I wanna present is a case where um, I want to highlight that uh, if endoscopic ear surgery is in your toolbox, you can certainly use it in some situations where um, um, you have other options, but they may be more radical. And um, this is a particular case where an 81 year old uh, female was referred to our clinic for um, otorrhea, and she had a tympanostomy tube placed with resultant clear otorrhea concerning for CSF leak. And uh, she had um, pretty uh, sig significant mixed hearing loss in that year uh, to begin with, and which worsened after the tympanostomy tube placement. Her uh, discrimination score was only 4%. Um, and her initial CT scan um, showed um, no obvious Tegman mastoid EM defect, but there was uh, a pacification of the mastoid air cells. And there was a defect centered right in this area, uh, right in the anterior epitympanic region. So we investigated this further with an MRI. And lo and behold, on T2 coronals, you can see a small encephalocele with associated CSF leak in that anterior epitympanic region, which corresponded to this uh, bony defect on the CT scan. Mastoid air cells uh, have CSF in them. And this was better to test it as well and was positive. So we had an extensive discussion with this patient. Um, she uh, is 81 year old, um, you know, traditionally for CSF leaks. Uh, in this location, middle fossa approach would be one of the approaches, but because of her age, um, that's, that was not feasible um, or was risky. Then um, because of her um, hearing loss, the other approaches would be to obliterate this area and close the ear canal or elect no intervention. Uh, so based on all of these uh, discussion, we first immunized the patient against pneumococcus and then eventually discussed with her um, potentially approaching this through a trans canal route um, because of her degree of mixed hearing loss. Uh, the plan was to remove the ossicles and expose this area and see if this can be repaired. And if not, then uh, we were ready to obliterate and close the ear canal. Um, so um, this procedure started with um, standard cleaning of the ear canal and injections. This is the prior area of the tympanostomy tube, which has a little granulation tissue to it. The TM is dull and thickened. Um, after adequate injection, a large tympanomedial flap is designed um, and it is curved superiorly and anterior to, anterior to the malleus um, so that the entire uh, anterior attic area can be exposed. <clears throat> did not have the typical suction elevator, so we used traditional maneuvers. Once the middle ear cleft is entered, uh, there was thickening of the middle ear mucosa and adhesions, uh, which was dissected. And um, this is the chorda tympani nerve, uh, the ossicles. And um, um, we've separated the IS joint and the incus was removed. The chorda tympani nerve was dissected and reflected posteriorly. Um, you had some intermittent signs that there was active CSF leak going on. Once further adhesions were removed, uh, we were able to visualize the cochlear form process, the stapes over here and the facial nerve right over here. Uh, we still don't see the encephalocele itself, so we uh, decided to proceed with an atacotomy using curettes and drill systems. Um, this was done um, very carefully, not as to injure the chorda tympani nerve. Once this was done, um, it was clear that there was an encephalocele right in this area. So this is the cog, this is the cochlear form process, and this is the anterior epitympanic area where there is an encephalocele with associated uh, pulsatile low volume CSF leak. 
So um, um, this situation, uh, because we are purely through the Trans Canal route, um, single-handed, I initially tried to do an underlay graft like the way we are taught, but it wasn't possible. And uh, I was worried that I may convert this low volume leak into a high volume leak. So we elected to proceed with a overlay repair, which uh, our rhinology colleagues use all the time in the interior skull base. And as such, uh, uh, we did an intra-op consultation with one of them and, uh, and then proceeded to repair this overlay. So we did some xenograft repairs, cartilage, then the perichondrium to bolster this area. And then <clears throat> once the repair was, uh, materials were placed, we did some valsalvas to ensure there was no active leak. And then we still further uh, reinforced this entire area with hydroset to obliterate that entire anterior epitympanic corridor. Um, um, and then use cartilage grafts to reconstruct the attic um, and the tympanic membrane, and then placed a porp, even though she had a significant mixed tearing loss. Nonetheless, we did place a porp and um, place a cartilage cap and then completed our tympanoplasty. Um, so she did well. She stayed uh, for a 23 hour observation. She had no uh, recurrent CSF leaks, CSF rhinorrhea or otorrhea. This is a post op MRI, which I don't have reconstructed T2s, but essentially uh, the area of the repair looks uh, like it has post op scarring. There is no active uh, fluid in the mastoid. There's some residual, a small, smaller degree of opacification but there is no, um, no CSF over trinorrhea or otorrhea. Uh, her post-op audio obviously did not show any improvement in her hearing. She's using a bicross hearing aid for hearing rehab. So with these three cases, um, um, I'm concluding my presentation. Um, if you have any questions or comments, you can certainly email me. Um, and we're looking forward to Dr. Mark Yuni's talk on more advanced lateral skull base uh, endoscopic approaches. Thank you.